I would go anywhere. So um, I'm really delighted to be here. I thought really what made sense to start with today was really to start with Roy Brown's story. And um, there's no one better to tell it uh, than Roy. I think the student had it right this morning. He is a hero. Larry mentioned there are 216 men and women across this country who have been freed by DNA evidence after serving an average of 12 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And each and every one of them inspires us uh, every single day and makes it a joy and a privilege to go to work. So uh, I'll come back and say some other things about what we found and what we learned and what we hope we can all do together, particularly here in New York State. But um, I'm going to introduce uh, Roy Brown. Every court I applied to, 
I'm begging you, let me just do the test. I didn't do this crime, I can prove I'm innocent. And they told me I didn't have any right to it. I wrote to every congressman, uh, every judge, every public defender's office that I get the, you name it, I wrote to them. The only one that answered me back was uh, Clinton's office, Lori Clinton's office. And they gave me the address of the Innocence Project. And they said they couldn't intervene in a state conviction. And I wrote to them and filled out an application. During all this time, I kept fighting in the courts, and I had to, I realized it wasn't DNA testing they were going to give me. When I was fighting with them, I had to prove something else. I had to prove a violation of my constitutional rights. And I guess there wasn't any. They convicted me fair and square. Uh, my mom tossed burned down, and I needed to get some copies of some of the statements that I had because I was in search of another statement from this jailhouse snitch who says I called him from the jail phone and confessed. So I wrote to the sheriff's department right after the, he was arrested by the attorney general's office for stealing funds and ordering officers to file false police reports. I wrote to the sheriff's office in hopes that I can get a, a statement. And what they did is they said, hey, send him everything because they didn't know what I had and what I didn't have. So they certainly want to make a mistake. Out of all the statements they sent me, 17 of them people I never heard of. They were never mentioned at my trial. They never existed. And the killer, in my case, had gave the police a statement. He had close ties to the sheriff, to the district attorney, and to the judge. And he spoke. Uh, he, 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 was, uh, he referred to the judge as Uncle Pete. You know? And when I went back to court in 1995 and 1996, the judge told me that I can't have DNA tested because I didn't ask for it before trial. I thought when the cops came up to me and I volunteered samples to prove my innocence. I thought I was asking for DNA testing then, and I didn't get it. I repeatedly went back to court with witnesses who, who admitted to commit perjury at my trial. They, uh, they kept on fighting me, spending taxpayer dollars to fight me every step of the way. After about the 10th year, 10 and a half years, I realized uh, I was trying to prove my innocence to people who already knew I was innocent. Whether they wanted to admit to the mistake or not, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, but I know that by telling me I couldn't have the DNA testing done, that they were a fear of the results being shown. And it makes a big difference when we do make a mistake, we need to correct it, not say we didn't make a mistake. I finally did get the DNA testing done. <clears throat> My main concern was uh, they gave me six months to a year to live in 2005. When I went to court on December 21st, 2007, I was 11 months beyond my life expectancy. I showed the trial judge that the DNA test showed that I'm completely innocent. I even found a killer for it. I did the cop's job, I did the prosecutor's job, because nobody wanted to admit they made a mistake. If the judge would have gave me the mail, I would have let myself go home. When I, when I got to prison, I knew, uh, I didn't know anything in the knowledge of the law, but I knew I had to either find the killer or get DNA tested done. And uh, that's just what I did. I had to adopt the role of an attorney. I had to study the law. I had to st study forensic evidence. I had to study how to be an investigator. I had to do all that by myself. My attorneys kept on trying to do everything they could possibly do for me, but the law only lets them do so much unless I have some newly discovered evidence. When I took them statements to the judge and asked for a new trial or asked him to consider it, he told me that he didn't feel that, that them statements would make a difference to the jury. And I thought that was up to the jury to decide if it would make a difference. When I was in prison trying to fight for the DNA testing, and they kept telling me no 19 times. I literally begged them to let me have the testing. My family raised uh, the money so I could have the testing done. When they, uh, when they denied me after the, after the last time, I figured, you know what? I'm gonna send this guy a letter and I'm gonna appeal to the courts and I'm gonna ask for DNA testing on him. This way I can prove that he did it, even though if I can't prove I didn't do it. And I sent him a letter and about a week went by the correction officer came to my cell, mad as hell, took me to the sergeant's office, they had a copy of that letter. 
and they had a copy of uh, the envelope that I sent it in. And this fellow here, instead of calling the police complaining about my letter, <clears throat> he killed himself. He escaped justice by jumping in front of a train. At that point, I felt, well, he's gone now, not a chance in the world that I'm going to prove my innocence. And this perpetrator, he had a, a, an ex-wife and kids, and his daughter, thank God, volunteered her blood sample for DNA to get a test done on her father to see if he was the actual killer. And they did the test and 99.9% .9 said, that's your man. After I proved all this to the judge, and after I proved who did it, he still sent me back to prison. He refused to release me because he would not admit that he made a mistake. That can only lead me to think or believe that that mistake was not a miscarriage of justice. That was an abortion. That was his friend that committed the crime. And he was not about to turn on his friend. The prosecutor wasn't about to do anything for me either. The sheriff's office already went to jail. No matter what, every time they see my face, it's just a reminder that I'm right, I'm innocent, and you're wrong, and they wouldn't admit it. We're only human beings. Everybody in here makes mistakes. The worst mistake is when you make a mistake and you realize it, and you try to cover it up with another mistake. And that's what they did. Had they not done that, I wouldn't have spent 15 years of my life in prison. You know? I didn't want to change the, the, the rest of my speech and content, but this girl called me a hero. And, uh, and I write a lot of songs, and I write a lot of poems. And uh, I was stuck, sat here thinking about that. And uh, there's a little park by my house. I go over there and I play guitar, and I get a few bucks playing guitar, because uh, I don't work on a job right now. Well, uh, so I figured I'd share that song with you. It's called Swimming with Faith. And so there's a lot bigger, more people than I expected to be here, so, but uh, I might not be able to play my guitar. But I'd like to tell you the words to that and leave you with that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll still recite the words to you because, so you understand what I'm saying. And it's, it's, uh, it's been some time now that I've been lost at sea. Party's already stopped searching for me. That been helping me take my soul to save. Crashing upon me comes another way. So I'm swimming with faith. Then it says, uh, the devil's waters, it's under God's great sky. Angels around me, is it my time to die? Yeah, you know I'm out here lost at sea. And the funny thing, it doesn't really bother me. I'm swimming with faith. He says, uh, well, you know I shouldn't have accepted that call. The devil invited me to come to his ball. I grew up in the west side, so I took a chance. And I went down to hell and I, to show him an angel can dance. Dancing with faith when I'm dancing in hell. I wore faith when I was in a prison cell. I gotta have faith when it's thundering in the pounding rains. I gotta have faith every time I'm wearing the chains. I gotta have faith, yeah, you know, when there's no one to call, and I got faith every time my back's on the wall. That's what makes me a hero, faith. Not prayer, faith. My whole, my whole dream of was to prove my innocence before I died. And that kept me going. I weighed, on, I weighed 105 pounds. When I got out of jail, couldn't see, couldn't walk. When I was in prison, they told me I had to work in the kitchen. Everybody in the kitchen has hepatitis. I didn't want to get that. I told them I wasn't going to work there. They locked me up. They said, I can't go to the law library unless I work in the kitchen. Thus, either stay in prison the rest of my life or go and get hepatitis and try to beat, beat it before I got out. Two months after I got out, thank God I got a liver transplant. And, uh, and I tell everybody every time I talk to people, I'm just glad to be alive today. And I, I hope this never happens.